Hi, I'm Mark Travis, and I want to welcome you to Inside the Travis Technique. It was the early 1900s. It's Moscow, Moscow Art Theater. And Stanislavski is a very well known and very powerful, influential actor, director, and producer of the Moscow Art Theater. But he was struggling with a problem that he saw. Actually, the problem he was really facing was that night after night in the Moscow Art Theater, performance after performance, they were so varied, they were not consistent. Sometimes there would be brilliant performances and sometimes really weak performances. That's where he started. How can I create more consistency in performances? Also, how can I create more authenticity? How can I create more realistic performances? And he came up with the notion, the idea, which is brilliant, because he was looking for a better way to work with actors. He came up with this idea of what would happen if we stopped thinking about our acting if we stop thinking about presentational acting, and this is the early 1900s when it was always very presentational. In fact, there were poses and attitudes you would take. Here's me being strong. Here's me being emotionally weak. And when it was all communicated through the body, and he would say, what if we stop doing that and we focus on the character? If the actor is thinking about the character and what the character wants and needs and fears and dreams, and maybe then we can create more consistent performances. And maybe we can create more authentic performances. First of all, he did it by starting a system. The system where, looking at a scene, he would say, okay, here's the character. What does the character want? And he would stop thinking about how should the actor play it? What does the character want? What does the character need? What's in the way? What are the obstacles? What, what are the dreams and desires of the character? Why does this character want this? What are the risks if the character doesn't get this? And he's created this system where you could, a template through which you could put every scene, every character, and just answer the most simple, basic questions about human behavior. In the 1930s in New York, the group theater, now the group theater was made up of a very esteemed group of artists, Ilya Kazan, Stella Adler, Luther Adler, Lee Strasberg, Sanford Meisner, and these actors and directors also wanted to create more authentic performances. And they were very much inspired by the work of Stanislavski. In fact, a lot of them went to Russia, to Moscow, to study with Stanislavski, to learn from him. And they were also looking for a better way to present characters on stage. So they developed a method, a method that allowed each actor to infuse their character with feelings, emotions, desires, ideas, and experiences based on their own personal life experiences and their own feelings and their own senses and their own memories. Also in 1930s, also a part of the group theater was Sanford Meisner. Now Sanford Meisner, also inspired by Stanislavski and Stella Adler and Bobby Lewis of the group theater, he thought there must be a better way. And so he developed a technique. He developed a technique where the actors could become more involved and integrated with their characters and with the scene by focusing on the other characters, by focusing on the other actors. And so that they could truly find the truth of the characters working under imaginary circumstances. Now, in the 1970s, I had the great honor and privilege of studying with some of these people. I studied with the group theater, with Stella Adler, Bobby Lewis. I studied with Harold Clerman. And these people were inspirational. And they encouraged me to keep thinking outside the box. They encouraged me to keep learning and looking for other ways. In the 1980s, I joined the actor's studio. I studied Lee Strasberg's method. And I also studied with Uta Hagen, and I studied with Jerzy Grotowski, and I studied Peter Brook. In the 1990s, I studied the Meisner technique, and I studied Michael Chekhov, and I studied Viola Spolin. 
And in the 1990s, I got to direct my first feature film. And it was a disaster. It did not work. It was really a disaster. I did my best, but it was very clear to me I had a lot to learn. And so I started teaching. I started teaching really just to stay afloat, but I started teaching other directors how to work with actors, what I needed to learn. I wrote a book on directing. I wrote a book on directing, not on how I direct, but how I wanted to direct and the director I wanted to be. And this book got published. And then I started getting invitations from overseas to go and teach. And there I am teaching all over the world and I'm teaching directors how to work with actors. I'm teaching what I need to learn. I'm teaching what I want to learn. I'm even sometimes teaching what I don't know. And no matter how much I studied, and no matter how much I taught, and no matter how much I learned, I kept coming up against the same problem. Directing actors is difficult. Directors are uncomfortable with actors. Actors are wary of directors. And unfortunately, too many directors, including myself, by default would fall back on result directing, thereby forcing actors into artificial presentations, not authentic characters, just acting. In 2007, it's 2007 and I am in Amsterdam and I am teaching at the Binger Film Lab. Now the Binger Film Lab is very much like the Sundance Institute. It's the Sundance Institute of Europe. And I'm there teaching eight very skilled, very talented directors. And I've been hired to teach them how to work with actors. And these directors are struggling and I'm struggling and the actors are uneasy. And I'm sitting there and suddenly I have this thought. What if? What if the way that we're approaching the challenge is wrong? What if the very concept of directing actors is wrong? What if the idea that I as a director should direct an actor is the very thing that's getting in the way of a character emerging authentically? What if the actor's best intentions of controlling and creating a character is actually stifling the character? What if my request to the actors to create some idea, to make choices, is actually getting in the way of the character making choices? What would happen if I stopped directing the actor? What would happen if the actor stopped acting? And these thoughts are going through my head. And I suddenly I turn to this room full of directors and actors in Amsterdam and I hear myself say, stop. And it goes quiet. And I say, stop directing the actor. Start directing the character. You know, when you teach, sometimes things come out of your mouth that you have no idea where it came from. You have no idea what it really means. But at that moment, you have the very strong feeling that what you've said is true and it's right. The room went quiet. And so I started demonstrating what I thought I meant. And I started talking to one of the actors as the character. I ignored the actor and I started talking as the character. And we spent the next five days exploring this technique, exploring of let's ignore the actor, let's not even talk about acting, let's not even talk like traditional directors, let's just talk to the character. And what I noticed was that the directors started to relax. The actors started to relax and characters started to emerge. And then one day, one day I'm talking to one of the actors and I'm talking to him as his character. I'm talking directly to the character and I'm interviewing this character like I had been doing for the past few days. But then something shifted, something changed. Suddenly my interview switched into an interrogation. Suddenly I started asking this character, 
tough questions, inappropriate questions. I started insinuating things about his character and who he was. I started implying things that maybe he had done or hadn't done. I started to, to probe and then prod, and something deep inside me, some deep, restless energy came out of me and started to attack and embrace the character simultaneously, and I watched this actor in front of me. This actor, who is now the character, I watched him come streaming up, defending himself, defining himself, finding himself, and I looked into his eyes, and a miraculous thing happened. I looked deep into his eyes as I'm interrogating, and I was aware, suddenly, that the actor was gone. And all I was looking into was the eyes of the character, and I was looking deep into his soul, and I saw in front of me this character bruised and bullied, getting formed and trying to find himself. And in front of me, full-blown, was the character that we'd been looking for, for days. And I realized I had stopped the actor from acting. I had stopped the actor from thinking. I had overpowered the thinking process of the actor, and all I was dealing with was the thinking process of the character, the desires and the dreams and the dreads of the character. And also, I had stopped directing. I had not asked the actor to do anything. I had stopped trying to control. I had actually stopped directing the actor. So there was no more directing and no more acting. And a while later, days later, I suddenly realized what I had done. I had stumbled. I had stumbled upon a technique that had totally embraced what Stanislavski was trying to do. Stanislavski was simply trying to create a situation under which actors could be more authentic, realistic, consistent, and believable on stage, night after night, moment after moment. And I had suddenly stumbled on a technique that was doing exactly that. Building on Stanislavski's work, building on Strasberg's work, building on Meisner's works, and all these other people I'd studied, it had evolved into this. I had a tiger by the tail. And I did not want to tame that tiger. I just wanted to harness him.